uh, we have Professor Vivek Positiver, an associate professor working in Department of Chemical Sciences at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, a premier institute in the country. So he's working in uh, Department of Chemical Sciences, as I already mentioned. He's also the member of prestigious Royal Society of Chemistry, London. Professor Vivek received his PhD degree from a DRDO lab in Gwalior, known as DRDE. He later worked as a postdoc in France and USA. He started his own independent group at university in UAE, known as KUST, that is King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, in 2009. He later moved to TFR in 2013. Uh, Dr. Vivek has published more than 100 research articles with H index of 51 and around 10,000 citations in reputed journals. He has recently received Young Career Award by Nano Mission of Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. He is also a member and reviewer of American Chemical Society and many more scientific bodies. So now I invite uh, Professor Vivek to discuss about the topic nanotechnology to combat climate changes and viruses. So Professor Vivek, uh, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Can you can you hear me, Nikhil? And can you yeah, yeah. see my slides? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can hear you and uh, see the slides as well. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Nikhil, for your kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, so today in my next 35-40 uh, minutes, I'm going to explain uh, the use of nanotechnology to combat the climate change and also the viruses, which is the current uh, current issue that we are facing, current challenge that we are facing. So the talk is divided into uh, four different parts. I'm going to explain the word nano, why nano, what, what do you mean by nano and why they are, they are different. As to other materials that you see every day. Then I'm going to explain the climate change, the, the basic science of behind the climate change. And then I will try to connect the nanomaterials or the nanotechnology uh, with the climate change and see how one can use the nanotechnology to, climb, to tackle the climate change. And at the end, I, also tried, I will also try to connect the nanomaterials or the nanotechnology with climate change and with the health, with the viruses. How do, how do I, I fight with the viruses using the nanomaterials? So the very first thing that I will do is I will uh, because I know, I know there is a varied uh, audience with a different subject, so I'm going to explain the term nano. What is nano? So ideally, if you look at the word nano, it's like meter, right? nano equals to 10 to minus 9 meter. But somehow, when you go at that scale, when you convert your material at that scale, at a nano scale, they show a completely different properties. And when you study these nanomaterials, the, the term is called nanoscale science. And when you use the nanomaterial to develop the technology, you, you, you call them the, uh, the, the nanotechnology. Uh, the technology is called as a nanotechnology. So ideally, it's a scale. One can uh, visualize the scale like this. So if I have to see seven meter, and then that that if you reduce that size to 10 million times smaller, then you get a football, which is 22 centimeter, that is 0 0.22 meter. But when, if I want to convert that football into a nanoparticle or a nano football, let us say, then you have to break that into 1 billion times smaller. It's like a hundred crore, you have to make a hundred crores of parts of that football to get to use a nanoparticle. So that's really, really small size. This is another way to explain the same thing. If I have to measure the two meter tall male, then it will be a billions of nanometer. If you look at the biological cells, they are also thousands of nanometers. Even the cells are bigger as compared to the nanoparticles that we are referring to. You know, atoms are one tenth of the nanoparticle, or nano, uh, say one nanometer of particle. So if you take a, a 10 atoms of hydrogen and align them in a, in a horizontal way, then you get a one nanometer. So they are really, really small particles. Another way to visualize the, the scale is you take a human hair, which is around 100 microns, the diameter, and you have to break that human hair into one lakh time. And then you get a one nanometer. So you can imagine how small they are. But what, what does it matter? Why, why do they, why, okay, they are small. So what, what, why, what will they do? Why, why they show a different property? So what are the properties that 
that changes when you go at a nano scale. One of the simple example is the gold. Now most of us uses the uh, wears these golden ring, right? Those, those are the golden. The ring is golden color. Why? Because this is made up of a metallic gold. You know, metal has this electron plow down to the gold surface, and whenever the light from the sun comes, it, it gets reflected by these electron plow down to the gold surface, with some amount of light absorbed in a blue light region, and that's why it's yellow in color. But the same gold, when you reduce to a nano size, will have a different color. It can be pink, red, blue, whatever the color you want. By simply changing the size, it's the same gold material. No doping, no functionalization, nothing. It's a pure gold, but a different color. So now the same electron cloud, which were reflecting the light, now start resonating with the light, and you get a different color. So that, so we can see the dramatic change in the optical properties of the material when you go at a nano scale. Think about a melting point. Bulk gold, the ring that you wear, you need to heat up to 1064 degrees Celsius to melt. Whereas if I make a nano ring uh, made up of a nano gold, then you need only 300 degrees Celsius to melt. That's a dramatic decrease in the melting point because now you have more atoms on the surface and it's easy, for, it's easy to move them and you need a lower energy to melt them. Another example, carbon nanotubes, another basic, one of the best material in, uh, in the field of nanoscience. The tensile strength of a carbon nanotube is already the strongest material that we use, right? So it's more than 100 times stronger uh, in terms of ten, tensile strength. And you can see now most of us also start using the helmet made up of the carbon fiber. They're lightweight, but their strength uh, is far, far better than even standard strength. So you can see you change the optical property, you change the melting point, you change the tensile strain, and there are several other properties that dramatically changes. They are dramatically different when you take the material to a nano scale. Now the question is, why do they change the material properties so dramatically? Now in order to understand that, we need to understand the surface area of the material. So what do, you, what do I mean by the surface area? So take an example of a toffee, a chocolate. You have a two things, right? One is the surface and then you have the bulk, right? And you know, most of these solids, most of the solids are, are liquid that you see, the number of atoms on the or number of molecules on the surface will be really low, and most of the most of the component is as a bulk, which is inside, right? You cannot touch them; you only touch the surface, right? The other way to understand this is consider a, a, a drop of a water, and now if I want to know inside the droplet, then you will see there's only one surface molecule for hundred thousand bulk molecule, so. The surface is really, really low as compared to the bulk when you are at a microscopic case, microscopic product, the, the materials, products that you see around by our eyes. However, when you go to a nano scale, there is a dramatic change in the surface area. For example, if I take a cube of one centimeter by one centimeter, you know, it has a six facet, so its total surface area will be six centimeters square. Now, if I break that cube into smaller cubes up to one millimeter, then the surface area will be 60 centimeters square. There is some increase in the surface area. But if I convert that cube with a smaller cube of a one nanometer size, now you see there is a dramatic change in the surface area, really, really different. So when you go from centimeter to millimeter, there's not much change. But when I go from millimeter to a nanometer, there's a dramatic change in the surface area. And surface area determines several properties of the material. And that is one of the key reasons for a nanomaterial to show a dramatically different activity. Obviously, surface area is not the only uh, property that, that helps uh, nanomaterial to show a different activity, but it's also surface energy. It's also the quantum confinement effect, which, has a, which, you know, which changes the energy levels, energy diagrams, and that changes the electron energies, and that also has lots of effect on its properties, which I'm not going in details now. So you can see now, the nanomaterial shows very dramatically different properties as compared to bulk properties, and I also try to explain you know, in a brief why they are different. Now the thing is, they're so small. How do I build them? How can I make such a small nanoparticle? If I have a ring, how do I convert them into nanoparticles? So there are two ways. One is called top-down method. So you already have your ring, which is the top of the materials uh, scale size. Now you want to break that centimeter size ring into nanoparticle, nano, nano scale. You keep breaking until you get a nanoscale. Obviously you cannot do it manually, but there are ways, there are instruments, uh, you know, using lasers or evaporation deposition, where you can take a bulk, a top uh, a ring, and convert that into small gold nanoparticles. The other way, which is uh, mostly used, is called a bottom-up approach. 
where you start with atoms and the molecules, which is the which is at the bottom of the of the product scale, right? So you start with the atoms and the molecules and force them to meet and and form the nanoparticles, right? And here you can form the nanoparticle of different sizes, shapes, morphology, and I will show you that they all show very different activities. Not only the size, but shape of the nanoparticle, morphology of the nanoparticle, they all show very different properties. So these are the two general methods where you use to make the nanoparticle. Another question that you may ask then, if they are so small, I cannot see them by eyes, right? They're really, really small. So even uh, visible light, uh, smaller than the wavelength of the visible light, right? Below 400 nanometers, how do I see them? So there are two ways to see them. Uh, uh, it's called the electron microscopy using a transmission of the electron or a, or a scanning electron microscopy. So the way we see it, we use the photon from the sun, right? And we expose the material with a photon and then some of the photon get reflected and your eye becomes your detail. Far smaller than 400 nanometer visible light photons. You cannot really see them. So I need to use another source of light, which has a wavelength uh, smaller than the nanoparticles. So we use electrons. We use a light of made up of electrons. You you expose the material with a beam of electron, right? Rather than a beam of a photon, and then you can see the nanoparticle using these two techniques. So this is a transmission electron microscopy, a complex technique, and you can see this is how the nanoparticles look like. Spherical in nature, some have a triangle, spherical, they can be monodispersed, they can be crowded, and you can also see the atoms, uh, atomic planes using these techniques. Right? You can see the nano rods, of the, and these are, you can also see the shapes. You can see these are cubes, these are the pentagonal, bipyramidal type shape of the nanoparticles. Uh, if the materials are made up of two different things, like say gold and silver, then I can also differentiate which one is gold, which one is silver, where is gold, where is silver, in the such a core shell type technique. There's also a technique called scanning electron microscopy. You also use the electron as a as a exposure, ex, uh, as a source to expose the material, but it, it looks uh, at a 3D. It, look, it looks more at the surface of the material, and you get a some sort of a 3D um, you know uh, view of, of your nanomaterial. So this is again these are the cobalt oxide. Uh, it's like taking a photograph but using the electron as a as a source rather than the rather than the photons, and you can see them very closely. Can you see the scale is one micrometer, but it's 500 nanometer here. So you can see at a, right now the, the techniques is so uh, developed that you can even see the atoms, uh, so, so high resolution TDMs. Now are these nanoparticles are really used in, the, in somewhere? It's just a research topic. So ideally they, there are lots of application of nanoparticles current right now in, in consumer products. For example, quantum dots, this was discovered in 1981. These are the materials of cadmium, selenide, zinc sulfide. And by simply tuning the size of these particles, you can get a different color. So the materials start emitting different color if I change size of these particles. So this, this seems, to be, seems to be one of the best discovery in the field of nanoscience. But is that has any use? There are several uses. One of that is quantum dot LED TV, QLED TV. Now it is in the market from several years, last few years, right? You get a very high resolution uh, picture quality in your TV. They're expensive, but you can see a uh, application of a fundamental discovery in the nanoscience directly to a consumer product. Another example is carbon nanotubes discovered in 1991 is one of the very stable material and it has several applications, uh, several extraordinary property in terms of strength, electrical and thermal conductivity and, and, and surface area, several things. Made up of only carbon, the coal that we see, right? But the same carbon material when is in the form of a carbon nanotube have a very different properties. And carbon nanotubes are used in range of application in concrete, in cache memory, in lithium ion batteries. They are right now they are used, they are used, so these nanoparticles are used in consumer products. Another example is graphene. They, you know, electron flies from one part to another. They, they are extremely, extremely conducting. So, and, and they are also flexible, right? So uh, people are using graphene to you get you the flexible cone, right? So it could have uh, several other it has lots of other applications. It has application in coating and paints. Nowadays, you see advertising the TV that you can wash your wall. They will never catch the dirt. All of them use a, a nanoparticle, which will make your wall dirt repellent, waterproof, and, and scratch resistance. You can also make those paints uh, a water purifier. You can make a building coat with a TiO2, a paint which has a TiO2, and then that TiO2, uh, the titanium oxide, has ability to harvest the solar energy, some part of the solar energy, and break down all the organic and inorganic pollutants that we have in the air. 
and you, you clean the air by simply painting your walls, external walls. No one can, India can learn that, right? We can have all our statues uh, painted with the TiO2 and they will not only inspire us, but they will also purify our air, which also seems to be the challenge now, right? Lots of application in pharmaceuticals, right? In drug delivery, uh, people are using nanoparticles to have a selective drug delivery to cancer the cell. Uh, even as a binder, silica is used as a binder to, to get you uh, a proper medicine. In cosmetics, in personal care products, you know, it, it protects the vitamin and fatty acids and antioxidant uh, by coating the nanoparticles and, and they shine more, they are more stable. One of the reasons why do I need to really use a nanoparticle in my cosmetics? So look, look at zinc oxide particle, or bigger particle, then your face will look like this white face because they reflect lots of light and they absorb UV light. But when you go to nano size zinc oxide particle, they still protect you from the UV light, but it, you don't know that whether you really applied it or not. So it's very clear. So that's the advantage of a, a use of a nanoparticle. In the that even you are standing in air, standing in the rain, you will not get wet. So you know waterproof cloths are. If there are stains, uh, the stains won't won't uh, stick onto your your cloth and it will get get clean automatically using by putting some of the nanoparticles onto the onto the cloths. This is another example where the cars are painted with 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 a material uh, which makes it uh, chipping free, scratching free. You know this is something we need in India, right? Whenever you drive a car in a traffic, you know how much scratches and chipping that happens. So you can have something like that, uh, a car which will never get scratched, whatever you do with it, right? In, in rubber products, they put silica to enhance the life of the tire. You know, you have a, now a new technique called nano solar cells where you coat uh, your roof and everything with the nano solar cells and then harvest the solar energy. So it's energy everywhere from the sun, right? You can have a DVD, that will hold millions of movies, not one or two, by, by using the, the concept of nanowire particles. You know, there, there are now a new thing where you can really connect your neurons with the computers by, by using the nanoparticles. You grow the neurons uh, onto some chip containing the nanoparticles and then whatever the activity of the neuron, you will, you will record it in your computer and that will that allow you to learn how the neuron behaves, how our brain behaves. People are also using the nanoparticles to detect the disease. The quantum dots, they go selectively to the cancer cell and start emitting different light. And by that, you can detect the cancer cells as small as 10 or 100, even, even at a very early stage. Right? This, this, is a, this is not real, but this is the, the future where people are thinking about a nano robot which go into your body and do the surgery. You don't need to open up your body. And it does everything that a normal robot does. So that's another a big thing that is that will come. So you can see uh, there's lots of application of nanomaterials in modern India. What about nanomaterials in ancient India, right? So our other our people, so our our culture has rich. Uh, it's rich in in terms of the knowledge. Somehow we lost the touch, or somehow we uh, we become artificially modern and trying to hide our own culture and our own knowledge but see whether the nanomaterials were used in our, in our, our ancient India. So if you look at Charak Sahita, uh, they use, uh, uh, they know how to reduce the particle size of the metal by the techniques of pyrolysis, prolonged heating, emulsification. These are all the techniques we use even today in our lab to make the small size particle. But this was known in third to second century BC and it is written in Charak Sahita. In seventh century CE, Nagarjuna, a prominent Acharya in Ras Shastra also described uh, making herbo mineral or herbometallic drops by using the concept of punapaka, which is again nothing but a heating and pyrolysis, exactly the same thing that we do or use even today in our labs. Right? So they know the method of reducing the size of the particle. So that means there must be some thought that we must reduce the size of the particle to tune the size of the uh, tune the properties of the material, which is unbelievable at that time because nanochemistry happens in the last 100, 200 years, right? So there's a process known as Basmikaran, which converts metal, a zero valent metal to oxide, which is less toxic in several cases. And that's why one can use the toxic metal as a medicine. Uh, as a medicine. And then once you convert that, you can also break those macro size particles into 10 to 50 nanometer by this concept called insulination. So they know 
how to oxidize they know how to reduce the size of the particle uh, because now smaller size you have a better absorption better treatment uh, better accumulation in your product one of the best example is swanabasma and and this was one of the uh, this is one of the best made ayurvedic medicine and uh, recently people found there are several reports where they found that it contains gold nanoparticles and by the way gold nanoparticle has very unique history in, in even in the field of catalysis people used to think that gold does nothing it's very unreactive material unreactive metal that's why it's shiny and doesn't corrode but when you go to a nano scale they show very different property even in the field of catalysis and several other fields and same thing is also true in medicine and the presence of gold which impart the uh, the medicinal activity uh, to swan basma and there are several other not only the gold but several other nanoparticles other metals iron zinc uh, tin the sulfide was observed uh, so indicating the role of uh, nanoparticles in old gold like uh, there's a reference which is to copper iron silver tin and they not only explain how to reduce the particle size but they also explain that how what happened when you go to the smaller size what is the dynamics of a chemical reaction of these metals at a smaller scale with water and heat this is something that people are still studying today the you know how the metal behave at at a smaller particle size how it interacts with water how how does it changes its activation energy you know melting point boiling point several thing and that was you know that was all also studied in third to second century bc in our vedic literature this is another example uh, damascus steel uh, uh, which uh, in recent nature paper observe, uh, they observe that it contains the strength of the steel at uh, this blade is because of the carbon nanotubes present in it and then recent study found that damascus steel is actually a, a indian steel uh, made in somewhere in south india and, and it's called the wood steel and 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 you and there is a literature where the use of a nano forms of a carbon who was observed as early as 500 years from the 500 last 500 years uh, this is another example the iron pillars of delhi and other we know these are made up of iron we know iron is oxidizes so easily by the air but some of these pillars are not rusted even from 1600 years and only thing that in addition to the iron that they contain is phosphorus around 2% of phosphorus but how come a 2% of a phosphorus will make them uh, oxidation proof so this is a debatable but there is a theory which says that there must be a nano layer of coating of the phosphorus and that may be the reason for the stability towards the rusting although this is a bit debatable but it could be possible and one can study that easily the other example uh, where they found the carbon nanoparticles in ajanta painting which is again old second century bc to 5th century ad indicating that people know that when you go to the smaller size they have different optical properties also So, if you look at the literature, there are several evidences that used in ancient India, and it is really surprising that our ancestor knows. Uh, you know, they don't really. I don't think they know the term nano science at least, but they know that when you change the size of the particle to smaller size, maybe again the scale is something that came recently. They know that you can tune the property, right? So. uh like there is a plenty of room at our bottom the at the bottom i think we should learn that there is a plenty of knowledge in our ancient india literature and we should we should have more research more research using a modern techniques and maybe we can learn more far more than what we are really you know, struggling to right with that i will now jump to a climate change i showed you the nanoparticles the how to make them how to see them what are their applications why they change the property now i change the topic to climate change and i will come back to nanoparticles and see whether we can marry the nanomaterials and the climate change uh, and solve the problems so why there is the climate change one single reason one of the best uh, one of the key reason is carbon dioxide we have large amount of carbon dioxide in the environment and what happens this is some sort of energy or earth energy budget you get lots of sun, energy from the sun some energy reaches the planet earth some energy gets reflected whatever energy reaches by the planet uh, it absorbs that energy again emitted from the earth and environment right but what happened although energy incoming is constant but the reflected energy energy we supposed to go out of the environment is 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 getting trapped because now we have large amount of co2 and that co2 trap that emitted energy 
and sent back to planet Earth. And that's how you start warming the globe. That's the global warming. And that has lots of effect on our planet Earth. That's very simple. So it's not only the CO2, but there are other molecules that also uh, cause the global warming. But CO2 has a, it's a very linear molecule, very stable, has a long lifetime. So it's one of the key. If you control the CO2, there is a very good chance that you control the global warming and climate change. And why CO2? Again, you can see here, if CO2 has the ability to absorb the infrared radiation, which is a part of the radiation that you get emitted. Uh, and, uh, and if you somehow reduce the CO2 concentration, these infrared radiation will go away from, the, uh, from our environment. And that's how you will reduce the, uh, you will be able to uh, stop the global warming or restrict the global warming. Right? What happens? Because if you look at the CO2 concentration uh, up to 1950, uh, up to the but now suddenly, after recent, not recent, but after say last 100 years or so, is a dramatic change uh, in, in the, uh, the CO2 concentration. And now it's uh, 415 ppm, which is highest reported in human history. So when the CO2 concentration increases, it will trap more and more energy. And you can see now the temperature of the, uh, the increase in the temperature. Uh, there's a dramatic change from 1880 and to 2000. So there's a, uh, and every year, every month becomes the most warmest month in, in, in our history. And because of the warming, the ice is melting in Arctic Sea. You can see the ice was 7 billion kilometers, a huge number. And with time passing by, you see uh, it's decreasing. The amount of ice starts from 7 kilometer per million. Now it's, 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 uh, it stopped around three uh, or something like that. So it's just a large amount of ice is melting. Now ice melts means the sea level will rise. Warming the water will again rise the sea level. So you can see there is an increase in the sea level. So there's a dramatic increase in the sea level. And there is a, a recent paper in Nature Communication, which uh, this is a theory, a uh, some sort of prediction, which says that if we continue this way, then maybe the Mumbai, which is supposed to be like this, will be like this, right? It's really a serious, serious issue. And we have to find out a way to stop the climate change, right? Is it too late to stop the climate change? Is it, there is too much CO2 in the environment. Can I do something? Yes. Ideally, there are two ways to stop it. One is our societal changes. Science alone will not be able to solve it. We need to change our, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle again. One has to uh, see how our ancestors did it, how our, you know, the Vedic lifestyle was. And one of the thing is we have this tendency to use and throw that need to be used and reused, right? A cyclic. Uh, economy where you don't throw anything, nothing is waste, everything is 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 useful. And if we do that, that and you save the energy and, and several other things. In terms of the science, if we can find out a way to capture the CO2 from the environment and convert that into some useful chemical that we can use. Say we we are dependent on petrol and diesel, right? Can I convert that CO2 into petrol and diesel? Then the problem is solved, right? CO2 is no more my enemy. CO2 will Help me to drive the car, right? Help me drive, the, drive my bike. So we have to find out a way to convert CO2 into petrol or fuel. And that can be done by the concept of uh, nanotechnology. You know, something, a dream like this, where rather than filling your car by petrol and diesel, I fill with the CO2 gas. And I keep driving my car lifetime. No need to put any more petrol or, or diesel. How do I do that? Scientifically, it's possible. Yeah, I take a CO2. And I have some sort of a catalytic converter which converts CO2 into methane using water and sunlight, which is all, both of them are free, freely available. Now, methane is your CNG, right? If you go to Delhi uh, or most of other cities now, we use the CNG cars, right? This is nothing but a methane, right? So now I burn methane, I get energy, I drive the car or bike, I go to, I again convert back CO2 to methane using the catalyst, sunlight, and water. And that will be a cyclic economy. That that means there will be no CO2 in the environment, no methane in the environment, and you keep driving the car. And this can be done by using the using the concept of nanomaterials. So this is our own example where we develop a new kind of a nanomaterial, uh, which has where we can tune the sizes, surface area, you know, there's great thermal stability, so that I can heat this matter up to 800 degrees Celsius and it still remains active. And we use these material to show. Not only us, but after our invention, there are now around 150 groups. They are using our material no, no, not only for you know the CO2 chemistry, but also in drug delivery to develop the batteries, sensors, light harvesting, 
large number of application of these materials. And we recently showed Amit Mishra is from your region, and he was an MSc student, and he he came up with a concept of you know silica is nothing but a sand in your uh, on our beaches and river, right? So it doesn't do anything. But if you take that sand and convert it into smaller particle and create some defects, right? And then it can convert you to into methane. Methane is your fuel, right? You can drive your car. And that's what the example. That's one of the example that from our lab. We can. We also showed the cold heating concept where you know think about this. You have a glass of water. Water is boiling, but your glass is cold. Something like that. Cold heating. And that concept we came up. Uh, we came up with a new material called the black gold material by tuning the distances between the gold particle. You can see gold now in a black color, not in a yellow or blue color. It's a black. It's still a gold. But it's a black color because now it absorbs all UV uh, visible light as well as the near IR light, and that's why it's black. And you absorb that all sun energy and convert it into heat. And I then use that heat to convert the sea water into drinkable water. I evaporate the water and condense the vapor. You get a pure water, right? By simply using the black gold and the sunlight. Obviously, you can say the black gold must be expensive. Yes, it is expensive, but it is reusable. Once I have it. i keep using it obviously if i can replace the black gold with something else it would be far better but at this stage it's not possible but black gold even if it is expensive if we recycle uh, it will be coming out right so i i show i give you the, the the hypothesis that can i do this can i drive the car using co2 when you see the example here co2 plus water i get methane using black gold dpc c is 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 a uh, term for the black gold and visible light visible near ir solar light so this is concept is there to prove this this big, uh, to fulfill this big dream obviously the yield is less the productivity is less because this is at a research level but science is there we can improve and we may one day come up with this uh, maybe one day you can drive your car using the co2 uh, with water and sunlight right so uh, and and at the end, in next uh, last 5 minutes or something uh, uh, nanometers for health so i showed you use of nanomaterials for climate change so can i use nanometers for health so if you look at the effect of climate change on viruses which we never thought about then in the recent study uh, in 2005 they the nasa scientists recover a, a bacteria which is 32000 years old and afterwards they recover another bacteria which is 8 million times old, million year old and and what they observe in this particular case that most of these bacteria is somehow resistant to all the top 18 types of antibiotics that we have now you can imagine if these bacteria and viruses infect us which we have no knowledge of even the corona virus which is now currently uh, infecting us we there are several viruses of corona family and we had some knowledge about these corona but think about the viruses and bacteria which has which are very old we have no scientific knowledge about the structure and how they behave and how they act and how they attack and if they come in into our life what will happen that will be really dangerous right so climate change has impact on the, the global warming has impact on the climate change as well as on our health on our viruses so but then again you know particle can be used to fight the viruses this is very recent discovery by sri chitra renewable institute of medical science and technology where they showed you the magnetic nanoparticle to extract the rna from the virus this is the way you detect whether you have a corona virus infection or some other vir viral infection you have to look at the rna structure and for that you have to take the rna from the virus and the magnetic particle does that the mask that we all wear every day now they doesn't kill the uh, kill the virus they just so all if you are exposing with some person who has a, who has a viral infection all the virus will be on your mask and we have the habit of touching the mask right you touch and then you touch your eyes and so that's really dangerous even if you have a mask if the viruses are there like they will be like until you kill them so you put a nanoparticles and there's nanoparticles we activate those viruses so your mask uh, is is will be, will act uh, will be more efficient and then this is not only the uh, stopping the virus but there are ways where you can even deactivate the virus uh, and here this paper shows that nano nanoparticles are graphene oxide it's not only the size but the structure of the uh, sharp edges and, and the charges on the surface all of these also matter in in their activity to stop the viruses uh, uh, you know the haldi that we all eat every day uh, in our 
uh, some dots from the curcumin, which is part of a healthy, and those shows very good bioactivity due to fight against the viruses, fight against the coronavirus, right? So, so you can see again our, our ancient knowledge of, of, of our eating habit, uh, how it is helping us. Right, so uh, this is the same example of use of carbon dots, and then people can use, people also use gold nano rod, which also help you to treat the viruses. And our own materials are also used for different application to fight the, the viruses. And one of the example is you can load the Ayurvedic the curcumin down to the silica APNS, and then that allows you to deliver it more selectively, more efficiently than only curcumin by itself. It's another example. Right, with that, I like what I showed you today is one can use the nanotechnology to, to fight a, a serious challenge that we're facing, which is the climate change. Climate change uh, can be solved by taking care of the CO2 in the environment, uh, use of solar energy rather than the energy based on the petrol and fuel, and also to, to fight the health, to fight the viruses and bacteria and, and protect our health. With that, I'd like to thank my group, uh, Antara Institute of Fundamental Research and other funding agency. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nikhil again for the invitation and, and the show speed for giving me the opportunity uh, to present my work. And I'd like to thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you hear me? I am audible. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Professor Vivek, for such an insightful lecture uh, regarding the application of Nantogazi uh, to fight against uh, fl fight for climate changes and viruses. Now, this uh, session is open for questions. I uh, advise the students to use the chat box uh, to ask questions. Uh, meanwhile, uh, sir, I want to ask, uh, like being as a young faculty member, um, can you provide us some tips uh, regarding uh, uh, the new faculties? Because in, in Delhi Gorakhpur University, many faculties have joined and they, they would like to be inspired uh, by you because uh, you as a young faculty have achieved a lot in, 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 in recent years. So it will be quite helpful to, uh, to us if you uh, provide some tips to be uh, successful in the field of science, maybe. Join TIFR, uh, mm -hmm. I was given a store's go down and they told me to convert into lab and start working. And that was a big, big setback. I thought I was coming from one of the best lab in the country, in the world, mm -hmm. and then suddenly I was I was told to go to the go down and convert that in. Okay, sir, yeah. Now there are, I had a two option. One is to run away and again go back to somewhere else in other part of the world. Mm -hmm. Or as, as an Indian, Daromat, so yes, fight karna hai, right? So that's yes, what I did. Yes. I fought with every single person because you know in government mm -hmm. institute nothing works more efficiently. Also, the okay. is one of the best, but still yes, we yes. have our own issues. Mm -hmm. So we, within a year we converted lab uh, that go down into the lab. Obviously, there was a good amount of funding from the institute. Yes, uh, yes. Good amount of support from one of the senior faculty in my my mm -hmm. department. We who real, they really guided me. They told me Vivek, this is how it is. You have to follow the rules of the game, but you have to progress. And that's how we did. The challenge for a younger faculty is the facilities. Mm -hmm. If you are given a good lab and good infrastructure, yes, uh, then no one can stop us. Then no one can stop India. The only problem is the facility. In fact, it's also not the money. You know, there are lots of facilities across the mm -hmm. country. But sub log leke bed gaya hai, right? They don't allow other people to use, right? That's the that's a typical sadistic mindset of we Indian, frankly speaking, I'm really uh, vocal about that. The problem is not the money. Problem is that not we don't have infrastructure. It's, also, it's only that our, you know, our this uh, negative, sadistic approach of not other people to use it. Otherwise, yes, mm -hmm. you know, if you buy a TM machine, which is a uh, 40 crores and maintenance of one crore, that machine should be used by every researcher in the country, right? Not yes, only sir. me and other people, everybody, 24 yes. by seven. That's what happened even in the richest country. Even in the couch, mm -hmm. which is so rich, instrument is you 24 by 7 by everyone. Yes. If we do that, I think the younger faculty is far, far talented and far, far sharper than, than the, the previous uh, one. And we, yeah. the country can do better. The faculty do, does better means the country can do better. The 
only yes, challenge sir. we face is the accessibility of the infrastructure it's also not the availability of the infrastructure it's only the accessibility of the instrument and infrastructure right that's, so that's the way true. out is we all the young faculty should make be vocal we should express this everywhere uh, i do that on the facebook twitter linkedin everything yeah. so that yes, you know the, the leadership at the mm. top should know what is happening yeah uh, by the time uh, you fight yeah meanwhile your friends can type their questions uh, so sir i am happy to share that uh, uh, many young faculties uh, got several different grants from our university as well so uh, recently like in department of physics only we got uh, around 2 crore of fund by individual faculties and uh, yeah so uh, we are uh, working uh, towards science maybe and uh, i hope we get this in our endeavors yeah so there is a lecture uh, there is a question by bhav gupta uh, a phd student uh, who is working with me uh, so his question is that how to control or modify uh, the distance between the nano particles of gold uh, yes yes bharat that's very exciting question Okay. and i did not explain because i thought that will be too deep uh, technical details mm -hmm. but since mm -hmm. you asked this was the challenge for us to be, you know how to change the size shape but how do i change the distances but then there is a concept of called nucleation and growth where once you have a nanoparticle sitting onto the surface at certain distances then if i add additional number of gold atoms then you can make sure that those gold atoms that go and sit onto the existing gold mm -hmm. nanoparticles and those gold nanoparticle will grow and they will come together right they will come closer to each other and that's why by by i, I, will, uh, I can maybe i will write you the email in more detail but that's how we we were able to control the nucleation and growth and we were able to uh, tune the distances between the two gold particles okay uh, any any other question from faculties maybe uh, any faculty from panelist but can ask so there is a question by anil singh which says all these are due to increase in the surface energy uh, yes when i say increase in the surface area obviously the energy will also increase so uh, it has a very direct relationship the uh, higher the surface energy that surface wants to react with something to minimize its energy right and it's that's what we uh, we do it in catalysis at least that surface is so reactive that molecule wants to react with the surface and to minimize the surface energy that's how uh, you carry out the reaction uh, with a lower activation energy so one question from yadav uh, an nst student kuldeep yadav has asked that how to use nanotechnology uh, to kill uh, to kill corona virus inside the human body how yes that's, that's also very very interesting question mm -hmm. in fact uh, a few months before i posted one facebook saying that you no know, one can take a fibrous silica the one i showed you which looks exactly like a corona virus and somehow there will be some interaction and yes. it kill the virus nobody believed but now last week there is a paper in acs nanolaser which exactly said the same thing they prepared a silica sphere with a spike and they said that this spike goes in between you know the in between the two two protein right you know if you see the coronavirus these are all spikes these surface proteins they have a gap of around say 8 uh, nanometer and then you make a spike which is also 8 nanometer which will go and fit it's like a lock and key and then you can have that surface coated with some molecule some some drug Uh, which will kill that virus and there are several other ways of doing that but this is one of the example very recent example uh, that is that came in the literature any other questions from faculties uh, hello hello yeah hello ma'am yeah hello thank you dr vivek for enlightening us on nano particles but when we use nano particles for drug delivery system do you have any idea what will happen to the nano particles inside the body like they can enter yes. the, they can cross the plasma membranes and they can enter your cells uh, what else they can do uh, they can like other drugs they have side effects what will happen to the nano particles once they are inside the cell yes this is this is extremely extremely important question that you ask which is the uh, the safety of the nanoparticles in the body and and this is something even even today is not completely researched people are trying to use the uh, nanoparticles uh, as a medicine but the side effect is not completely studied although there are some nanomaterial like a silica is already used as a medicine as a binder so we know that silica doesn't affect the uh, affect the health so one can use uh, go ahead and use the silica nanoparticles but what about other nanomaterial that is something is there are lots of studies coming in but that part that part one has to worry about 
So when, when you test the nanoparticles for health benefit, you do also test them, evaluate them for their toxicity and, and other side effects on the health. That's what uh, people are trying to do now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so question by uh, Professor Anil Singh uh, from University of Allahabad, the uh, English College. Uh, lifetime of these nanoparticles uh, uh, is less in comparison to normal material, material or uh, what? Is there any idea? Ideally, ideally, yes, right? See, when we say nanoparticles are very active because they are smaller in size, they have very high surface energy. And then they try to interact with the molecules and do a reaction with the CO2 to methane or photon to heat. But then they can meet by themselves, right? One 5 nanometer goal will meet another 5 nanometer, becomes 10, 20, 100, right? So, and then they grow. So they are very unstable. So in that sense, they're like, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and there is Bharat Kutta again asked, like, can we uh, differentiate uh, for detecting or deactivating the coronavirus? Can we de defense? What is that? I don't know. Detect, yes, yes. The, 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 both mm. of them are DFNS alone. That, that is DFNS, something we are yeah. trying to do a research. Mm. We are going to write a paper where mm -hmm. we are, we are, we are show, we show that one can extract the RNA from the mm. viruses using the DFNS far better than the recombinant material that we are writing a manuscript right now. But there are ways where you mm. can use the plasmonic DFNS to detect or deactivate. Mm -hmm. One I already showed you the example of this lock and key mechanism, physical, only physical interaction to deactivate the virus. So it's possible. And Ankita Bhattabhyam. Nanotechnological approaches, uh, it depends on the cancer type. Uh, this mm -hmm. is something I don't know because I don't work in the nanomedicine. Uh, mm -hmm. But it could be if, they, if the pores of those cancerous cells are different, then maybe you have to use a different size of the nanoparticle. Right? If the pores are big, then you know the bigger particle can go in and, and, and deactivate or kill those cancerous cells. If the pores are really small, the entry of the mm -hmm. uh, that cancerous mm -hmm. cell, then maybe you have to use a smaller nanoparticle. So you, if that Information will definitely help to tune the nanoparticle sizes. Yes, so I think uh, uh, we should stop this uh, session here. Okay. Uh, students who want to uh, be, be associated with uh, Professor Vivek can join their Facebook uh, page or uh, can join them on Facebook. And okay. let's thank uh, the Professor Vivek for such a wonderful lecture. Thank so um, uh, for such an insightful lecture on uh, the applications of nanotechnology for climate change and viruses. Let's thank the speaker and uh, uh, I, I thank you all. Thank I thank all the viewers watching this video, all the uh, faculties, research scholars, students. Uh, please, uh, I would like to end the session and thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank thanks. you everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, sir. So I would like to end the session now. In meeting for all.